All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started here. We'll still let everyone continue to trickle in, but today we are doing our Air Force Community Tech Talk number four. We're going to be discussing IT asset management and discuss that ServiceNow has to track and manage the physical, contractual, and financial aspects of hardware and software assets. My name is Shawnee Nicholas. I'm a solutions consultant for the Air Force account. Um, but I would like to introduce Eric Farrington and Tony Funkhauser really quickly. Eric, do you want to start us off and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Eric Farrington, um, product management director for uh, ITS management here at ServiceNow. I've been with ServiceNow approximately uh, two years uh, in the product role. Um, but my relationship with ServiceNow, I, I've, I've been in the ecosystem for a little over 11 years, uh, starting out as a customer, also spending time in our services partner community, uh, helping customers implement and, and uh, advise them on their uh, maturity for asset management solutions. Uh, and now I am uh, with ServiceNow, making sure that we extend those solutions to all of our customers through our core products. Yes, and good morning, everyone. I am Tony Funkhauser. I'm an advisory solution consultant with our federal team, supporting the Air Force account folks here. Um, been with ServiceNow about seven and a half years. My primary focus is uh, IT asset management, uh, specializing in software asset management, which we'll be talking about today. Awesome. Thank you both for the introductions and for being here with us today. So both Eric and Tony will be providing a lot of information today, and we are recording this session for folks to revisit the information if needed. Additionally, we will be sharing this in our community center for future reference. So for the agenda today, we're going to provide a high level overview of the now platform and then we'll dig into IT asset management in the demo and we'll wrap up with some Q and A. So for everyone on the call, you are muted, but if there are any questions during the session, you can use the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen and we can address those questions during the session as they come through. So let's go ahead and get started. What is ServiceNow? So simply put, ServiceNow is a workflow automation platform designed to host applications. Now within the platform itself, we have different capabilities that you're, utilize, you're able to utilize with any application that sits on the platform. So we have workflow and integrations where you're able to route work effectively through your enterprise and connect different lines of business in an automated fashion. We also have our configuration management database, which is really the core foundation of the NOW platform, allowing our three workflows to provide that inoperability folks are seeking. We also have our knowledge base for that self-help ability for end users and our service catalog, so end users are able to utilize information on products that your organization may have to offer. But all of that is really fueled and enhanced by machine learning, AI, and analytics. Um, our web, mobile, and conversational tools. And we also have developer tools as, yell, as well. We use the industry standard of JavaScript and integrations. So as I said, we have three different, IT, three different workflows and we have our IT, employee, and customer workflows. So each of these workflows have different portfolio offerings in them. And then within these portfolio offerings, we have different applications. Between the three of these workflows, we have over 50 different applications that you're able to utilize. Pre-packaged, ready for consumption, right out of the box. So our IT workflows are really where we're going to be focusing today, and they're really helping to help manage and track resources and performance. Then we have our employee workflows. Those are for your internal facing teams, so they have that single location to manage their work needs. And last but not least, we have our customer workflows, which are really meant for your external facing customers um, you all have, because we recognize at ServiceNow that not everything is internally driven and not everything is related to IT. So as I said, we have over 50 different applications prepackaged and ready for consumption out of the box. However, if there's a particular niche you're looking for, we do have our app engine where you're able to customize applications using little to no code. But what is all of this without great experiences? So we have our mobile capabilities that we've integrated to the platform for text messages, for notifications, or our now mobile app 
where you're able to access some of these workflows. We also have integrated web-based applications, so there's no need for installation. You can access us from the web. And then we have our conversational tools, because what's the purpose of breaking down silos and routing work effectively through an enterprise if you're not able to converse across the platform? But that is all to say we are a systems of record. So we do recognize also at ServiceNow that not everything is going to be in our platform or related. So we enable you to integrate third party applications and systems onto our platform where they can utilize our platform capabilities. And you might think, well, why? But here at ServiceNow, we're really not looking to change the way you work, just how your work's connected. So by integrating these third party systems, you're able to have all your applications, your data, your infrastructure in one single location. Now with that, and as I said, we will be going into the IT workflow today and we will be discussing IT asset management. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Tony now, but once again, you can use the Q&A feature anytime during this session, we'll be monitoring it and please ask any questions that you have. Tony? Tony, I think we're starting with Eric first from a hardware perspective. Okay, yeah, no worries. Eric, you wanna go ahead and get started? Sure will, thank you. All right, I am going to, uh, and can someone confirm visual uh, before I get started here? We got you, bud. Excellent. So, um, you know, certainly echoing on the, on the introduction, uh, within IT asset management, we are putting a, a holistic focus on really managing those, those IT assets across our business. Um, and that is across the asset life cycle, which is really from the time that we're planning to acquire that IT asset all the way through its end of life. Okay. Um, and really, we, we're putting a focus on that financial, contractual, inventory functionalities um, to be able to ensure a quality and accurate da uh, data record, as well as making sure that we have visibility uh, to that object as it moves through its life cycle. Really, the purpose here is to be able to um, maximize visibility, to minimize the risk associated to it, um, and also then be able to optimize our environments. In, in layman's terms, we're really saying, do we know what we have, and can we prove that that record is accurate? ServiceNow as a single system of action is the opportunity uh, where work happens, right? So our, our, whether it's our end users or our IT agents or fulfillers, where uh, these individuals are, are completing uh, incident ticketing for issues, change ticketing for uh, changes to our active environment. And we wanna make sure that we're um, aligning not only what work activity is taking place, but what asset is it taking place against so that we have the opportunity to capture a quality update of who is that object assigned to, uh, where is it located if it's not meant for an end user. Um, what, what, uh, where, does it, where does it physically reside? What's its current life cycle state? Um, really, that's what we're looking to address within the platform. So we bring in some core features and, and, and really it's meant to put a reflection on um, being able to establish uh, a front end request module for our users. So when they come in and say, I want or I need, making sure that they have the ability to tap into a request catalog to uh, display and, and complete that work. Once a request goes in, making sure that our fulfillers or our agents, so whether they're in procurement or IT or supply chain, have the visibility to see, I see the user's request, I see what they're requesting, here's how many are in demand, here's how many we have available in our current stock. And I could transfer that existing stock to fulfill the end user's needs, or I could initiate a purchase order and buy net new. We have the ability to align our platform to those ERP or financial systems of record, um, but retain that copy within ServiceNow so that as we're bringing the work forward in our workflows, we have the ability to say, here is our request. We decided to cut a PO. Now, after that PO has been cut and sent to a vendor, we have the ability to take our next step through ServiceNow, which be like a physical receipt. Um, I will show some of these features off in our, in our time today, but really, again, this is really showing the interconnected nature that as these workflows go forward, we're making sure that we have the ability to tap in, um, to engage our employees in an efficient manner. And number two, also make sure that we're capturing an accurate asset update. So here's a, here's a depiction where on the platform, we could perform a manual receiving activity where we were typing serial numbers in as part of that physical receipt process, or 
we can leverage the ServiceNow mobile app, which scans barcodes or QR codes and brings that data in directly to populate your asset database. So removing that manual type feature, removing the risk from that equation, and making sure that we capture an accurate, accountable update every single time. Okay. We also have the ability for, and through the app as well, for the end users to view uh, hardware assets that are assigned to their profile. Okay, an example here is uh, I drop my computer, I crack my screen, um, I want an efficient way that I don't have to sit on hold of the service desk. I could click that, uh, identify the object that I, I have the issue with, click the button to report the issue, and now my ticket is off in triage with all of the device information necessary. Okay. So we wanna be able to then extend when we talk about after a device is out of service, can we plan for the retirement of that object? Can we plan for a physical disposal? Can we execute that hardware disposal process? Okay, and making sure that we have a centrally populated asset record um, that allows us to capture and validate all of that detail. Okay. Now, a couple items I do want to show from a demonstration purpose today, and I'm going to bring over an, an instance of ServiceNow. Okay, I'd like to be able to um, would like to be able to show a couple of features here, um, just to orient us in in the discussion. We are looking at a hardware model form, okay? And this, uh, the hardware model form is separate from the individualized serialized asset, which is actually our next layer down in a data record. Separating the model detail from the actual asset record allows us to strengthen our ability to report on not only the completeness of this record, um, but I could also then run reports and say, show me all of the model, uh, all the assets that have this model in my environment. Okay. I can see the individual states that break down of those. I have 200 in stock. I have 700 deployed as an example. But when we're looking at this model record, we're seeing critical criteria that's captured and that really identify this hardware model. In this case, I'm looking at a Apple MacBook Pro and I can see the manufacturer part number that's associated. One of the key features that we have on platform within the ServiceNow product as part of hardware asset management is the ability to normalize our model records. We're normalizing it against a standard content library that ServiceNow curates and applies on the back end of this database. So what's happening here is as this hardware model is being populated either from a manual input um, an import of a spreadsheet, or even running a discovery technology, it is reconciling that data that has been entered into this form against that backend database. And it's matching it to a standard value based on the manufacturer part number, the product, and also the manufacturer. This really solves the issue for customers or organizations that have traditionally had CMDBs and they start getting duplicate values for models. Um, they're getting it from manufacturers. Um, I cited that I was once a, a customer. I worked for a very large health organization in North America. We had this exact same issue. I was running multiple ways of importing. I, I was, we were spanning across North America, had multiple people inputting records into our database. And in something as simple as the manufacturer field where we would like to have a standardized value, I had 31 unique values in this table for Hewlett Packard. And the variations were very simple. It was H dash P, H space P, Hewlett dash Packard, Hewlett underscore Packard, 31 unique values. And that really hindered my ability to accurately report and say, show me everything that I have from HP. Okay. Normalization against the product model allows us to bring it to one common value map all of those aliases through a, a normalization engine process and give you a very clean reportable result. In addition, we're bringing in from the content library, when we normalize this product, we're bringing in hardware model lifecycle values that the manufacturer publishes out. So values such as end of sale, end of support, end of existing support, and end of life, are all available and all um, populated into this instance when we do normalize against that record. This gives me the ability to have um, visibility 
strategically, not just uh, against the individual record, but if I was looking at show me where this model is in use and what services in my entire technology portfolio it's supporting. We have the ability to relate those life cycle values. In this case, my employee engagement service is dependent on this class of Dell PowerEdge server. The, the risk I can see against this service is high. Well, why is it high? I can see the life cycle values for the Dell server that this Dell server is actually scheduled to be manufacturer end of life this October. So it's by utilizing that model lifecycle data in a different view to a different audience to be able to see that common data and now plan how do we not get strategically impacted by this end of life? Can we refresh this model out? Can we create a demand in a project and, and manage um, and, and get this out of my organization? That is the power of the ServiceNow platform is that we're leveraging that model data that's coming in from my model tables and surfacing it to a completely different module and a completely different purpose, okay? This is why data accuracy from a sound asset management practice is so critical is because we can drive the decision-making and enhance the clarity that these strategic plans can have, okay? So the other piece is when we look at our asset management, we have the ability to manage um, inventory as it's stocked around our organization. We have the ability to uh, look within a particular uh, warehouse and we have the ability to see, oh, let me get one that's open. We have the ability to see assets that are related to that stock room. In this case, we can see what would be in service um, and, and what we actually have in stock for that location. We also have the ability to call out multiple stock room types. So knowing that within my organization, we have a um, hierarchy from a central warehouse to a warehouse, to a pickup drop off, um, even to some, an onsite or satellite location. This allows me to conduct transfers of that stock through different sourcing channels. I also have the ability as a stocker manager to create stock rules, which is establishing thresholds of what are my stock levels that should exist, oops, what should exist inside of that stock room. So if I pull up, I'm gonna to stick to the MacBook example, but in my Sydney warehouse, I have a threshold that at all times, I must have 15 MacBook Pros available and, uh, for a requestable consumption. I have a job that runs in my system and that when this goes down to 14, which is that actual inventory level, it will kick off a reorder with my stock order process to place an order for 40 new units. Now, these are completely adjustable. They're completely, you can set them by stock room, by model, and it allows my stock room managers to have full control over what they have on hand and even gives them the ability to adjust those threshold levels if they're monitoring their reporting and saying, well, we're ha we happen to be carrying more inventory this quarter. I wanna be able to review uh, from a dashboard view, what my open stock orders are, what my open stock rules are, and then really be in dynamic management of that environment. Um, another piece I wanna call out and highlight within our asset management feature sets um, is the ability, I, I touched earlier on our mobile capabilities, um, and I want to extend the demo here just for a moment into a live demo of some of that mobile feature. Okay. So our, ServiceNow apps run on uh, iOS or Android technology. Um, and we, we do display out an agent app and a mobile app, the mobile app being end user facing. One of the key features we wanna to touch on here within our hardware asset management solution is the ability to, let me get to the right instance, is the ability to come into a stock room or any office location or managed location in my ServiceNow uh, database and perform a inventory audit. So I've come into this, this um, come into my mobile app on the left hand side. I have a new audit opened here for my Frankfurt warehouse. Okay, what I can see is that this audit has not been conducted yet. You can see it's brand new. Um, these can be scheduled out to be performed in the future. If you want to set up weekly stock room audits, you can do that. 
Um, but what we do is we leverage here uh, barcode scanning technology off our mobile device, and it allows for multiple inputs so I can scan in sequence. So if we pay attention to the left-hand side, I'm going to open up the camera and begin this scanning process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be scanning barcodes in a sequence, and I'll get a green positive checkmark indicator each time that a scan has been successfully completed. You'll notice on this review button that there will be an integer increasing too, showing me exactly how many assets I've scanned. So you can see as I'm starting to hover over, now if I'm moving through a stock room or I'm moving through an office environment, you can see the speed and accuracy at which I can scan. Okay. One of the pieces here I'll call out, I'll call out a couple more just for the sake of this demonstration. Okay. And I'll do one more. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna come back and I'm actually gonna double scan one of those items. You know, I, I happen to scan that asset twice. When I come in, I can review and I can see that I have asset tag 21 in represented twice in this uh, audit scan. I have the ability, I can manually remove it from the list, but also the scan smart enough to know that if I enter duplicate values or if I have multiple people scanning this environment, that it's gonna take the latest, latest scan date. So when I upload this, what you can see is it's coming from my mobile device and my ServiceNow instance is actually updating in real time. So it's writing that directly into my ServiceNow instance. And I'm getting some interesting results. So I'm gonna refresh this view. And we can see what types of results we're gonna get from an audit. Within here, we're seeing, number one, we can see a full list of all the assets I expected to find. Everything that was listed on that form as uh, in that stock room. I can see that I scanned seven assets and they were expected to be found in the Frankfurt warehouse. So green column, good to go. I scanned two assets, but they were not expected, meaning they listed different item details than the Frankfurt warehouse. We have automatically updated those records to where we physically scanned them, where we physically audited them. I have 37 assets that I have yet to find that list Frankfurt warehouse as their current location. That means that I may need to come back to my mobile app. I may need to be able to open up my scanner and continue to scan more assets in. I can come back and do another scan and do a batch upload. Okay, and when I submit that, what we're gonna see, quantities are gonna update in real time. So you see my indicator flip from seven to 10, my number of expected and found went down, everything is in line um, and lockstep. So um, I do also have the ability to complete the audit. Once I complete the audit, this record is completely locked down from all future edits and modifications, and now can be placed as a historical record of audit. I can report against this to show uh, the behavior. I can see the accuracy of how many I've found. I can also now open investigations to be able to track down these 34 that listed that they were in the Frankfurt warehouse, but are not actually present. Okay. So this is really the way for us to say, um, you know, are we being able to perform those updates? Are we able to have visibility of the assets? Another piece I will call out, the last feature I will call out is um, within ServiceNow, we are creating what we call standard practice workflows for your, um, to really define processes that relate to a common asset experience. So we're using our flow designer, which is a low code design approach to give you standard practice flows that speak to a specific outcome. So standard hardware request, hardware disposal, bulk stock ordering, some of the ones I've mentioned. We give you this flow with all of the tasks necessary to complete in order to complete that activity. The other piece is we build an automation so that as my workforce is completing these tasks, the asset related automatically updates. There is no more manual dependency to update asset records by the technician. All they need to do is confirm that they completed the work the task asked them to do and the right asset was related. If that's done, we like to say the asset comes along for the ride. It removes the burden of them having to click, click, click into a database and update manual records. It also removes the burden of risk for the organization that it was completed correctly or it wasn't skipped. Now, all of these flows are written in our flow designer technology, which is a low code workflow design approach which means it's very easy for our customers to look at and say, well, I really like this flow, but I want to insert an approval task. 
to make it fit my business. You have a okay. low code option to drag and drop and bring these items in. Hey, Eric, we had actually a question related to this. Um, so Mike Davis asked, does that lifecycle data require input or is it fed from some other database? So I wanted you to touch on that question if you could. Yeah, absolutely. So coming back to the lifecycle data on the, um, our hardware model records. So we do have within the normalization service, right? We have the ability to bring that content down to your instance. Um, and then it is also updated on a weekly basis. So as my content team continues to curate more content, um, they have the, you will receive that weekly feed and weekly update of those records. You also have the ability, if I'm gonna just click into a record here, and I can see that I don't have model life cycles associated, I have the ability to also create them myself. Now, if this was a publisher that I had access to and it's not in the content service, you have the ability to update it and it's gonna show source of internal as opposed to a source of service now. But I also have customers where they um, buy the extended support for all of these model classes. So they actually wanna differentiate from the publisher life cycle to set their internal general availability to extend to that end of support term from the manufacturer. So they can then report on that internal because they know they really don't have to be concerned about end of sale. They don't have to be concerned about end of support, but once it enters end of extended support, that's when they wanna be notified and it's out of their internal general availability. So we are flexible for you to be able to have visibility towards the manufacturer content, which we provide in the normalization content service, or for you to also generate life cycles based on your internal parameters. Okay. Shawnee, any other questions? No, not right now. We've covered most of them in the chat, but once again, folks, you're welcome to yeah. go to the Q&A section at the bottom and ask any questions that you have for Eric right now. Yeah, and again, the piece I'll call out while I look for a couple of questions here, right? We, outside of the standard features of being able to manage, um, uh, being able to manage the, the asset, being able to manage the inventory, being able to um, really have that end-to-end -end visibility, you know, here's some areas that recently we have spent some development effort, and I've touched on a couple of these. The normalization process, the life cycle automation for removing all of those manual updates, the ability to audit my inventory stock rooms or any uh, location that I manage, whether it's a data center, whether it's an office location, being able to do that with the mobile app, either offline or online. And then of course, our hardware asset dashboard, which really is that single pane of glass command center view for our, our asset managers to have control of their estate. We have filtering on here that allows us, I don't to get into, we have filtering on here that allows us to either manage that estate at a global level for my organization, so across the board, or I have the ability to apply filtering if I as an asset manager wanna cover specific locations, specific stock rooms, I could select, and you can see how these results filter down for my particular area, as opposed to the whole organization. Giving me visibility into end of warranty, disposal status, or even procurement or inventory reporting. So I will take a pause before I hand over to Tony. Uh, Shawnee, are there any other questions we want to surface at this time? No, no other questions at this time. Thank you so much, Eric, mm -hmm. for showing us some about the hardware asset management. And Tony, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, if I can unmute myself. Uh, yeah, no, thank you, Eric. That, that was great. And I'm going to be dovetailing off of some of that functionality. Uh, but we're looking a little more uh, into software, uh, software license management. Uh, we have a function known as uh, SAM Pro, Software Asset Management Pro, that I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, our three primary themes uh, in the time we have today are in helping our Air Force customers manage compliance risk. And we're not just talking about um, you know, compliance with a publisher in regards to a true up. Uh, because we are native to the platform uh, and interconnected with things like hardware asset management, security operations, uh, we can also help to be compliant with security risk. Uh, we have a newer function uh, known as exposure security, vulnerability exposure assessment, 
where we can very quickly go out to that CMDB or that centralized database and, and identify uh, any software titles that may have came in in the form of a uh, zero day vulnerability. Uh, optimizing and saving hard dollars. Who doesn't like to do that? You know, having that visibility, which is the primary output of SAM, is really going to help us understand what software we're using, what software we're not using, where's our overspend, etc. And then my favorite here is the ability to increase efficiency. Uh, because SAM is native to the platform, as I mentioned, and already interconnected to many of the other IT applications, modules, and functions, uh, I'm actually operationalizing that visibility and that output and sharing that to areas like change management. Somebody wants to add new cores to a server. I can actually see what that cost is going to uh, increase to. Uh, the vulnerability management, uh, as well as onboarding and offboarding airmen. Uh, being able to allocate software uh, as new airmen are coming onto the command. Uh, so Eric talked a little bit about the hardware asset management lifecycle. Um, software is not much different. Uh, there are a few nuances here, but again, you know, following having a automated solution that's going to follow that lifecycle and, and really help you understand what you own, are you buying what you need, and using what you have. Uh, some of the primary problems that I'm sure many people in the room today uh, can, can nod to is that lack of visibility, um, you know, does cause problems. Uh, it's really hard to get the picture when you're working with spreadsheets. Uh, and we provide many dashboards and analytical uh, content uh, that really is going to help your SAM team and even, you know, the commanders and the executives in the organization and better understanding, um, you know, how much they're spending, not spending, et cetera. So functionally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure before I jump into my demo. Uh, SAM is fairly straightforward. You know, I like to call them the apples and the oranges. There are two pieces that we really need. We need that inventory, whether it's coming from an endpoint management solution like Tanium, uh, SCCM, Big Fix. There are several that we integrate with. Uh, or can import data from. Uh, and then there's also our discovery, ServiceNow's automated discovery. Uh, when we're talking about desktops, laptops, end user compute, we can very easily ingest from those endpoint management solutions into the CMDB. We're gonna normalize publisher product version. Uh, it's when we get into the data center, we have uh, several purpose-built discovery patterns that are looking for things like Oracle database options. Uh, uh, guest host relationships in your virtual environments, SQL Server additions, all, the, all of these things that uh, come into play when you're calculating a license position. Uh, the Apple side of that are going to be the use rights or the software entitlements. Uh, I'm sure in DPASS we have uh, a lot of these records today. I think Gain has already responded to how we could potentially integrate um, with that system of record. Or we can you know, get to a point where we're manually entering in um, you know, license entitlement, software entitlements. So once we have those use rights or those software entitlements, we're going to run reconciliation. We're gonna actually compare with what we discovered with what we purchased, and the output is that visibility that I'm gonna show you today. Uh, probably won't have time to go through all of these use cases uh, too deep, but I'll start off with uh, you know, requesting software. Imagine an airman coming into the organization, uh, going to a portal um, you know, through their web browser uh, that's been provided them. I can go to a catalog here, or I can do some uh, Google-like searching, uh, contextual searching, but I'm gonna go to a category here. And when I go to this category, I'm gonna be presented uh, certified or whitelisted software titles that I have the right to access. Uh, we can filter this down based on uh, CAC card authentication. If you're a new airman, maybe I only want to show you productivity software. If I'm some, somewhere higher up the chain, uh, I may see everything that that command is offering. In, in this case, I'm a developer. I've been tasked with uh, doing some development work. I'm going to order a copy of Dreamweaver. Just like Amazon, I could add to the cart and keep shopping. May wanna go get a developer laptop or a piece of hardware to do my development on, but I'm just gonna go ahead and order a single copy just to show you uh, some of this functionality. Uh, once I do that, I'm presented back with a receipt. 
that's going to give me uh, you know, an estimated delivery time. It's also showing me stages of that fulfillment. So I can see here that it was automatically approved. Right now it's waiting uh, to be fulfilled. So I'm gonna grab this request ID, go on the back end here and, and dig in a little bit more using my global search. Uh, can search for anything on ServiceNow uh, through that capability. Uh, this is taking me to that request fulfillment record. And if I wanted to visualize that workflow, I could do so. Uh, we can see that because I had a rule here, anything under $1,000, I'm going to automatically approve that. Uh, it then spawned another workflow. Uh, we can have workflows running in parallel or uh, when one ends, uh, another one starts. This one has created a procurement task. So if we go back to the record, I can see that task has been created, assigned to someone in procurement. Uh, they would get a notification if they had that set up, or they could just go in here into a queue and open this record and work it. Uh, they're going to learn a little bit about the request. There may be some additional fields they may need to populate, but I'm just going to go ahead and source this request. Uh, that's going to go out into the inventory and it's going to show me how many rights of Dreamweaver I actually have available in my software entitlements. Uh, if I had zero here, I could go ahead and cut a purchase order, hand that off to DPASS or whatever acquisition system you're using. Uh, we can by, by synchronously um, connect to those uh, um, legacy uh, solutions, but I don't need to do that. So directly from here, I can go ahead and add that allocation. I see that I have two different entitlements one is per user and the other one is probably per device. Yeah, so I'm gonna grab the per user and I'm gonna find myself here and go ahead and uh, add that allocation directly. Well, no, not add that allocation. Go ahead and submit that allocation directly for uh, my use. Uh, so now if I go back to that record, we can see the allocation has been assigned uh, to myself here uh, or whoever uh, is requesting this software. And so we're already, you know, down that path of, of getting use out of that Dreamweaver title. So any questions on that end user experience? Let's talk a little bit about the apples and the oranges. So we talked about uh, ingesting or discovering uh, software installs, putting them into the CMDB. Here I have uh, just a filtered view of a, a laptop or a ThinkStation. Uh, I can open that record and from a from an asset management perspective, just like Eric was showing, I'm looking at this machine as, you know, from a financial total cost of ownership. I want to know what state it's in, what location, who it's assigned to, what contracts might be associated uh, with this piece of hardware. But Sam is a little bit different. I'm going to switch hats and go into my configuration management view directly from this single asset record. When I do so, I'm looking at attributes and properties that more of your operations teams are, are concerned with. Uh, CPU count, core count, that certainly comes into play when we're counting uh, software licenses. If I scroll down here, I'm going to see software installation attribute tab. Uh, because this is an end user compute device, I'm seeing primarily Microsoft and Adobe uh, productivity software. Uh, but these are licenses that I have to pay for to use. So Sam is primarily looking at the software install table uh, or tab, and the same would be for servers. You know, servers are gonna be a little bit beefier. It's gonna have a little bit uh, different type of uh, applications running on them. Uh, certainly gonna have more cores, uh, which come into play. If I go down here, you know, we can see things like SQL Server, Oracle WebLogic, uh, those things that are typically in the data center. So that's the oranges. It's when we get into the software entitlements. Uh, and, and we do have a, uh, a, the ability to import entitlements. We have a quick start guide or a template that you know, we suggest our customers start out with if they're consolidating multiple spreadsheets. Uh, at the same time, we could also be working uh, with your teams to integrate uh, with DPASS or whatever system of record today potentially holds those contracts, those um, software entitlements, et cetera, uh, to make that a little more automated. Once we import these, we're going to run through some error checking, looking for things like publisher part number not found, any duplicate entries, 
uh, purchase rights should be greater than zero to really help you kind of weed out those errors and any uh, duplication, duplicate records you might see. Uh, once we have the apples in there, we're gonna run reconciliation. Uh, we have several features built within our reconciliation engine known as reconciliation dimensions. Uh, this is where I can pick individual publishers. Maybe I'm only interested in creating a Microsoft position. Uh, maybe I want to look at a certain base uh, or a certain, uh, you know, air command. Uh, the Army is using this today where they've modified this core company table uh, to represent certain bases or commands. Uh, maybe I'm looking at a certain, um, you know, station and I even want to go as far down into a particular department or cost center and get a view or a product results on that particular publisher that I'm looking at. Once we run that reconciliation, we're going to start populating uh, the SAM uh, content or the analytic views. Here I'm looking kind of at that enterprise view like Eric showed us with hardware. I'm able to look across my entire command or whatever's in my purview and look at things like true up costs with some breakdowns on who those biggest violators. In this case, it looks like IBM represents a big part of that 3.1 in the form of 2.6 million. Uh, publishers and products out of compliance and even potential savings that can be realized or deducted from this true up cost in the form of software that's not being used. Uh, we have the ability to define a reclamation rule. I'm just gonna pick on uh, Microsoft Project here if I can find it. There it is. Uh, this rule states, uh, based on total usage time, if you, Mr. or Mrs. Airman, are not using Microsoft Project at least five hours over a three month period, I'm going to flag you as a reclamation candidate. Uh, we then can then kick off that orchestration activity uh, using your endpoint management solution to go out there and pull or reharvest that license. We can put that back in the inventory or even reallocate that to someone who may be waiting in a queue uh, to use Microsoft Project. So very powerful use case there in the form of reclaiming instead of buying more, I'm actually gonna you know, save some money here and reclaim unused licenses. Uh, compliance summary is just looking at three different levers here, publishers out of compliance. You know, I can drill in on this trend chart and look at data uh, with some breakdowns by publisher, by product, by location, and really start to do a deeper dive into my reporting and understanding how my software is being used um, or, or even those potential savings that are being realized. Uh, one of my favorite dashboards is the life cycle. I know within DOD, uh, there's a big effort to get end of life or end of support um, software and even hardware you know, back in the correct support structure. Uh, in the Orlando release, we just added our software model lifecycle report, which we're visualizing on this dashboard here. But it's really, it's going out into my CMDB and it's showing me software titles that are end of support. Uh, I'm even looking at things in the future. You know, I may wanna drill into one of these bars, dynamically go out here and look at all of my software titles and, and get these back into a support structure. So really beneficial reports. Um, hey, Tony, yeah. I have a quick question here um, about the software license management discussion. So how is the data input into our ServiceNow platform? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we can ingest uh, endpoint management inventory. Uh, we have very mature integrations and, and spokes uh, for tools like Tanium, uh, these are agent-based solutions that are, you know, helping you with your patch management, helping you to de deploy software, things like that. Uh, SCCM is probably our most mature, but like I said, SCCM, Big Fix, Tanium, Altiris. Um, there are other ways to import data in a little more manual. Uh, we prefer to use those integration modules that are built into the platform. There's no extra charge for those. Um, so yeah, that's how we bring the data in. It's then when we go into the data center where we're a little more dependent on our uh, purpose-built discovery patterns. So ServiceNow automated discovery would also be used to populate software installs in the CMDB. Kind of a long-winded answer for a straightforward question. No, thanks, Tony. That, yep. that answered it. Um, <laughs> 
Also, I have one more question. So Mike Davis asks, how does ServiceNow reconcile things like environment licenses? So i.e. Microsoft server data center licenses. So that a server, so that a server created in the database center isn't counted against my standard license. Uh, I think that's going to be a little longer of a question, but yes, yeah, we do that. Uh, I mean, we have publisher packs. So something I didn't have the time to go over were our publisher packs. I don't even think I have a slide in this particular deck. Um, but those publisher packs, let me go to my army deck here. Bear with me, folks. Our publisher packs are going to provide uh, the license metrics. We call these the P1, the priority one publishers. Uh, publishers like Oracle. IBM, Microsoft, they all have their own way of counting or calculating a license position using these various metrics. Uh, built into SAM Pro are these publisher packs. We even have a, the ability to customize, create a custom license metric group and metrics. And then a common publisher pack is just going to be for those more generic type of license metrics per core, per user, per name user. Uh, but if I understood the question correctly, we have um, the logic built into SAM Pro and the Microsoft Publisher Pack uh, to go out into your data center. It's when we get into the license workbench and we drill into one of these cards here where we're going to see our various products and, and how they're um, you know, being counted or whether they're out of compliance or in compliance. I can then drill in and start to visualize let me find one that's got some data on it here. I can start to visualize the rights that are owned coming from my software entitlements, uh, the rights being consumed. These are the things we're discovering and, and you know, finding either through the ingest from your agent-based endpoint management or our discovery, and also telling me how many rights are available. Or if I'm over-licensed or unlicensed, uh, I'm gonna start seeing things like true-up cost uh, in that form. They, you, you want to keep these always at zero, your true up cost. But having visibility into that spend is also very important. Uh, so in the last few minutes I have here, I think we're doing okay. Uh, this publisher overview is actually a deeper dive into those publisher packs. So I may be responsible for that Microsoft BPA or license position. I'm going to spend most of my time in this tab. Uh, but we do have tabs for Oracle, IBM, VMware, and we're always adding new publisher packs as we go along. I mean, they're all gonna take into consideration uh, that product, uh, like in this case, Oracle database options. These are very expensive options, $11,000 per core. You can imagine that can rack up pretty quickly on a, uh, on a well-built out blade or, or physical server. Um, but I can see that I have 40 of these database options that aren't in use. Trust me, when Oracle comes in to do their audit, they don't care that they're not being used. If these have been activated, uh, they're going to be part of that true up. But I can dynamically drill in and see in the CMDB exactly what those database options are. I can get with those DBAs and those uh, server owners uh, to go in and deactivate these if we're not using them. So very beneficial. And like I said, IBM's got their own view, sub and full capacity, RVU, PVU type of metrics. Uh, we're even visualizing some end of life, uh, end of support, that life cycle data we talked about. Uh, VMware, we have some neat little map overlays that are showing me my vSphere and, and ESX servers by region. Uh, but let's drill in a little bit to the Microsoft in the last two minutes here. Um, like I said, these are all dynamic views. I can drill into any of these trend charts here, or in this case, I want to see these 11 products that are out of compliance. Like I said, that's going to take me into my license workbench. I can always go in from the top level and, and look at all of my software, or I can look at publishers out of compliance or even get to the one that I'm responsible for. Uh, flip this toggle. It's only focusing on those products that are out of compliance. I can then drill in here and look at the, uh, you know, different flavors and, and kind of better manage, uh, you know, my rights owned, rights available, uh, true up costs, things of that nature. Uh, one last thing I'd like to show is that uh, um, uh, better together story, how we operationalize the output. In this case, let's talk about service management and change management specifically. 
Uh, if you might imagine a change request like I uh, set up earlier, uh, someone wants to double the core count. We've identified the configuration item that's in, in this change request, but because I have visibility into the software and the metrics that are being used to count that software, we then expose that license change projection right on the change record. So now when I go to CAB or the change review uh, board, I'm gonna be able to see my current spend, uh, the projected spend change, and what that's gonna bump it up to. So that's a pretty hefty uh, uh, bump there, just because uh, an engineer wanted to uh, add, uh, get rid of that slow performance. Uh, it gives us a deeper level of uh, visibility uh, into the potential spend there. So there are several others and we would love to have the opportunity if we wanna do a deeper dive uh, into much, much more. Uh, but I think I covered somewhat the basis uh, uh, or at least the functional aspects of how we take the apples and the oranges, we reconcile them, we normalize them and, and provide that visibility in the form of dashboards and reports. Thank you all. Yeah, Tony, thank you so much um, for going through that with everyone. So I know there currently aren't any questions in the chat box, but we are opening it up for Q&A folks. Uh, so once again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Tony, in the meantime, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight for us? Yeah, since uh, there are no questions. I mean, like I said, there are several other dashboards. Uh, this one in particular, is managing, uh, you know, giving you the visibility into your normalization. You know, we're always striving to be at 100%. Um, you know, actually 84.8 or 85% is pretty good. Uh, there are always going to be software titles that aren't in our content service. Um, you know, even down below here, we're able to visualize the updates uh, for self-hosted customers, which a lot of our DOD customers are, uh, these updates come every two weeks. Uh, we provide that uh, catalog update to our customers who are managing on-prem. Or if you're in our IL-4 cloud, FedRAM cloud, we push these out every Monday morning. So you're always able to visualize the before and after. Um, this is just demo data, so it's not the full set here. But you know things like new software packages, new normalization rules, new lifecycle data. Like I said, we're reaching close to 500,000 different software titles, uh, I believe, um, that, but we're continually adding to uh, that content service. And then in the Paris release, as Eric kind of hinted around or teased us with, we're gonna be adding hardware uh, models uh, to the same content service. So some of the same goodness or enrichment in the form of lifecycle data uh, will be available uh, here at the end of the summer. Um, quick look into what that normalization looks like. So when we discover raw data or ingest from your endpoint management, I'm just gonna pick on this Microsoft Office. These are the raw values that we're discovering. Microsoft, Microsoft Office. You never know how you're gonna see Microsoft spelled sometimes. I think I've seen nine different ways uh, of spelling Microsoft. It's typically this version string that I really can't make any sense out of. We're gonna run that raw data um, through our normalization engine, compare that to the content, uh, that industry known nomenclature, and we're gonna translate that to Microsoft, Office 365, 2016. We're then gonna go out into the rest of the CMDB, look for any other instantiation of this version string, and we're also gonna normalize and stamp that. So now we are um, normalized across our entire uh, database, centralized database, uh, for that Microsoft Office 365 Pro Plus product. Awesome, thank you so much, Tony. It looks like that we don't have any other questions. Um, and I know we have about five minutes left. So if there aren't any questions, I can give everybody, you know, these last six or so minutes back. But I do wanna mention that next week we will be holding our Community Tech Talk 5 on Wednesday, July 1st. So we'll provide an introduction and demo to our Safe Workplace app that we rolled out recently due to the impacts of COVID-19. So we do hope everyone can make it. And I just want to thank everyone again for joining us. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you again, Tony and Eric. Thank you. Have a good day.